Hi, everybody. Whoa, that's loud. So thanks so much for coming today. It's really a pleasure to introduce my colleague and friend, Dr. Dan Nancy Donovan, who um, actually came to me about a decade ago or so. Is that about right? More than that. I More than that now? Um, she's a great example of how general psychiatrists can be retrained to enter the world of geriatric psychiatry and not only have a major impact on the field clinically, but also a profound impact on the field from a research standpoint. So uh, I don't know if Nancy will tell you more about her career path, but it's a very interesting one. So Nancy's currently the Director of Geriatric Psychiatry at the Brigham, uh, where she's an associate researcher as well at Mass General Hospital and assistant professor at Harvard Medical School. Um, she's a co-investigator in observational studies of aging and Alzheimer's disease at MGH, as well as clinical trials research at the Center for Alzheimer's Research at the Brigham. Her own research focuses on neurobehavioral changes in aging and preclinical Alzheimer's disease and the association of these symptoms with AD biomarkers and related brain changes. She has research funding through the NIA and private philanthropy, and she's uh, a member of numerous organizations. Um, as a really quick prelude to this talk, I must mention to you all, you will be hearing later today, if you haven't already, that there's a lot of news in the Alzheimer's world that is not terribly favorable today. A, a clinical trial that we were involved in here at McLean over the past two to three years uh, had an interim analysis that demonstrated the drug was not likely going to be effective. Um, it's a huge disappointment for the field. Um, the patients who were in this study were in the very, very early stages of Alzheimer's disease. Um, were still functioning as uh, professors at their local law schools, running their own companies, and, um, and it's hugely disappointing news. So although the treatments or a cure are not on the horizon in the next couple of years, as we thought they may have been, um, we're going to be dealing with a lot of people who are aging into the risk factor category for Alzheimer's disease and the work Nancy's doing on identifying early markers that are not the typical hallmarks of the illness like memory loss is really critical. Uh, no matter what happens with the field of research to try to find a cure, we're going to still have to care for these patients for decades and decades and we're going to have to get more general psychiatrists to become more interested and knowledgeable about working with older adults. So that was a long introduction, Nancy. Are you ready? Yeah. All right. Thanks for being here. Thank you very much, Brent, for the introduction and for actually inspiring me to uh, get into geriatric psychiatry as a field. As he mentioned, I, I was one of I was thinking about this, and it was about 15 years ago, I think, think that I took care of a um, an uh, older retired MGH physician who ha had depression and bereavement. And um, this was a former patient of Brent's who came to me. And, and when I think about it now, I remember being very fascinated by that case. And it was one of the patients that inspired me to move into geriatric psychiatry. And the fact that he was bereaved, uh, I think, actually is relevant to some of what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, so I'll be uh, discussing, um, well, these are my uh, sources of funding. I'll be discussing our work um, that investigates uh, emotional and social function in preclinical Alzheimer's disease. Our research examines Alzheimer's disease as a possible etiology of neuropsychiatric or psychiatric symptoms in cognitively normal older adults. In the Harvard Aging Brain Study, we ask whether Alzheimer's disease uh, specific pathologies, cerebral, amyloid beta, and tau, are associated with uh, these symptoms in unimpaired older men and women. Okay. And if so, um, we'd like to understand what are the most salient neuropsychiatric symptoms. Um, are these uh, clinically meaningful associations, and do these findings have clinical relevance? We focus on Alzheimer's disease because it's a highly prevalent a neurodegenerative disorder. Alzheimer's disease pathological changes are common in older adults with dementia. It's the most common pathology in dementia. But they're also common in non-demented older adults who are affected by earlier stages of the disease. Alzheimer's disease is now defined as a biologic or a pathophysiologic process. Um, rather than a specific clinical entity, such as dementia. 
it encompasses both preclinical and uh, clinical stages of impairment. It's defined by the accumulation of these specific pathologies and in increasing levels of clinical impairment. And importantly, neuropsychiatric morbidity also increases across these stages. So this is a clinical challenge in early AD. Can we uh, differentiate uh, neuropsychiatric or psychiatric symptoms due to preclinical Alzheimer's disease from other pathologies and causes? When is a psychiatric symptom in a cognitively normal person likely to be due to Alzheimer's disease, and when is it not? We think that this may be important uh, because recognition of phenotypic neuropsychiatric changes could enhance our ability to identify older individuals early uh, before the onset of cognitive impairment. And there's evidence in the literature to suggest that treatment of neuropsychiatric symptoms at the preclinical stage could also have disease-modifying effects. But the Packwood study uh, from a number of years ago showed us that preclinical uh, neuropsychiatric symptoms may emerge very slowly and be difficult to detect. In this large nested case control study, uh, depressive symptoms appear to emerge in cases in red approximately 13 years before the onset of dementia. But they don't diverge significantly in cases or, or versus controls until about um, eight years prior to dementia diagnosis. So we'd like to be able to recognize these symptoms within this eight-year window, and ideally in the uh, few years before the onset of mild cognitive impairment. Our collective work within the Harvard Aging Brain Study aims to define what are now called transitional cognitive and neurobehavioral changes that occur during the preclinical phase. These early markers may include uh, subtle objective declines in cognition. So these are individual, intra-individual declines in cognition within a normal range or uh, certain subjective cognitive complaints. Um, and we believe that neuropsychiatric symptoms such as depression and anxiety may fall into this category as well. And, and in ad addition to studying uh, traditional uh, neuropsychiatric symptoms, I've become interested in looking at uh, other types of changes um, that may be uh, uh, relevant, such as loneliness or subtle changes in social engagement or social interactions that may be indicators of early neurobehavioral decline. So to study this, we've begun to, understand, uh, to examine associations of these various uh, neurobehavioral changes with uh, amyloid beta and tau PET. This is an example of tau and amyloid beta PET images from individuals with varying levels of pathology and uh, clinical impairment, ranging from normal cognition on the left to AD dementia on the right. And the first three columns, A, B, and C, correspond to uh, cognitively normal older adults with increasing levels of tau pathology that you can see in the coronal images in the top row, and also increasing levels of uh, amyloid beta burden in the whole brain images in the second horizontal panel. You can appreciate um, the increased signal and anatomical involvement of these pathologies with increasing levels of disease uh, progression and severity. And it's worth noting that um, these in vivo data have been consistent with our understanding of the natural history of amyloid beta and tau accumulation derived from prior neuropathological studies and staging criteria. I'll be discussing then our work that focuses mainly on uh, amyloid beta and uh, neurobehavioral symptoms, and I'm going to start by presenting our longitudinal study of amyloid beta and depression. So this study included the full uh, HABs cohort of 270 older adults. They were strictly defined as cognitively normal by the clinical dementia rating scale and normal MMSC and logical memory. They had generally good mental health. Um, individuals with a history of mild remitted uh, depression were allowed, but 
others with major psychiatric diagnoses were excluded. And everyone uh, scored below cutoff for depression on the geriatric depression scale at baseline. We measured amyloid beta um, using a Pittsburgh compound, the PET. And uh, we used a continuous measure of PIB binding derived from an aggregate of uh, neocortical regions uh, that are typically involved in early AD. You can see that the mean GDS score was low in this sample. It was only 2.8 out of a range of 0 to 30. Um, but 13% of the sample did have a self-reported history of depression, and in 6% of the sample they had had this depression diagnosis in the two years prior to uh, baseline. And about 8.5% of the sample were taking antidepressants, mostly SSRIs. In 2015, when we uh, enrolled the full uh, cohort, uh, we performed a principal component analysis of the baseline data and found that these subclinical depressive symptoms that they endorsed aggregate into, into three clusters. And we defined these clusters as the apathy anhedonia cluster, the dysphoria cluster, and the anxiety and concentration disturbance cluster. And for those of you who uh, know the geriatric depression scale, you know that there's a, a question, um, do you have more problems with memory than most people? And that particular item didn't load onto any of these factors, in fact. And um, there were a few other items that also were hardly endorsed and weren't included in the analysis. I will point out, though, that there were some questions pertaining to uh, concentration, and those did load onto the anxiety uh, component. In our own prior work, we found a no cross-sectional association of neocortical amyloid beta uh, and um, subclinical depressive symptoms. And this is consistent with other large uh, studies, such as the ABLE, the Australian uh, uh, study, and uh, the Mayo Clinic study of aging. It, normally, if you take a, a sample of cognitively normal older individuals, they won't have higher depression related to their amyloid beta levels. But we wanted to understand the longitudinal association of amyloid beta and depression over time, and also the relationship of amyloid beta and uh, depression within these three clusters. We used mixed effects models with backward elimination. Uh, our analyses included in the pool of predictors, PIB binding or amyloid beta, age, sex, Hollingshead, which is a measure of socioeconomic status, Aminard, a measure of, social, of cognitive reserve, APOE4 carrier status, this is a major genetic risk factor for Alzheimer's disease, depression history, and the interaction of each of these variables with time. In our first model, uh, we found that higher baseline amyloid beta burden, or PIB, predicted steeper rates of increase in depression scores over time. Depression history was related to higher, but not worsening, symptoms. So as you can see in the figure, um, uh, the participants with the depression history have a higher GDS intercept, but the rate of change in depression symptoms is a function of their PIB levels at baseline. And this is just showing two representative values, one standard deviation above and below the mean value for, for PIB. And we found a similar pattern um, with our anxiety and concentration disturbance cluster scores. Higher baseline PIB or amyloid beta predicted steeper rates of increase in these symptoms. However, we didn't see a relationship between amyloid level at baseline and the apathy, anhedonia, or uh, dysphoria symptoms. Nor did we see a relationship of APOE4 status with uh, depression uh, symptoms over time. And we ran an additional model uh, removing these concentration disturbance items from the anxiety uh, concentration disturbance cluster scores, just to make sure that this effect was not totally driven by the uh, more cognitive uh, symptoms. And we found that 
this PIB time relationship remains significant. So to summarize uh, these, uh, this, this initial study, uh, we believe these findings suggest that in preclinical Alzheimer's disease, amyloid beta may be more closely associated with anxiety than other depressive symptoms, at least as we're measuring them by the GDS. But it's important to note that um, amyloid beta uh, accounted for a small percent of the variance for anxious depressive symptoms over time in this sample, so it was a small effect. There were questions, though, that were un that are continue to be unanswered by this uh, by these findings, such as uh, did antidepressant medication use affect the, this relationship between PIB and anxiety symptoms, and are there other unmeasured variables such as tau accumulation um, that are more closely and strongly associated with depression scores over time? In a second study, we investigated then associations of amyloid beta and anxiety using an anxiety-specific instrument. Um, we took advantage as well of a new framework for uh, understanding amyloid beta and staging people in, in terms of their amyloid beta accumulation into earlier and later stages of accumulation. And I, this was carried out um, with uh, my colleague Bernard Hansu, who developed this uh, new uh, staging framework. We know from neuropathological studies that um, amyloid beta deposits across the brain over time in a typical anatomical sequence. Initial accumulation involves regions of the neocortex um, at the top, um, later this includes the allocortex, the striatum, uh, the brainstem, and the cerebellum. And as uh, amyloid beta deposits broadly across the brain, it also uh, deposits more densely within these neocortical regions. PET studies have commonly uh, focused on measuring uh, and analyzing amyloid beta deposition in neocortical regions. And they typically uh, classify people as amyloid uh, negative or positive based on neocortical thresholds for positivity. And using this approach, about 25% of cognitively normal people are um, classified as amyloid positive. And we do believe uh, there's quite a bit of evidence now uh, irrefutable evidence that um, amyloid beta positive um, individuals decline more rapidly than amyloid beta negative. Using a longitudinal data from uh, the Alzheimer's disease neuroimaging study and HABs, Bernard developed a three-stage um, framework um, that classifies people into stage zero, which is equivalent to the amyloid beta stage, uh, negative stage that I showed you previously. And then this amyloid positive stage is subdivided into stage one and stage two based on um, high neocortical, low striatal um, PIB or amyloid beta or high PIB in both neocortex and striatum. In this study then we we're interested in looking at the cross-sectional association of anxiety uh, with uh, regional amyloid beta. And we hypothesize that anxiety would be a symptom of later uh, uh, accumulation. Uh, it would be higher in stage two compared to the earlier stages. And we also hypothesize this, this association would be stronger in E4 carriers uh, consistent with anxiety as an Alzheimer's disease-related symptom. This study, uh, we only uh, had this uh, anxiety instrument um, administered to a subset of the sample. Um, so this was 118 cognitively normal men and women. Um, we used the uh, anxiety subscale from the hospital anxiety and depression scale. Um, And again, amyloid beta was assessed uh, using PIB-PET um, and neocortical and striatal aggregates. And we used previously defined uh, 
thresholds for positivity to classify people into these stages. Using the traditional binary staging, we found that HADS anxiety scores did not differ in amyloid positive or negative groups, um, as you can see on the left, or by E4 carrier status. And these are showing data for models adjusted for age, sex, education, MMSC, and GDS scores. Using the three amyloid beta PET stages, however, we found that anxiety scores um, uh, were higher uh, in stage two uh, compared to stage zero, but did not differ between stage zero and one. And this difference was mainly driven by participants in stage two who were E4 carriers. And then in secondary analyses, we looked at uh, continuous measures of PIB in subcortical regions and found that levels of thalamus and amygdala PIB were positively associated with, with HADS anxiety. To summarize then, um, we found that uh, cognitively normal older adults with more advanced amyloid beta accumulation reported significantly more anxiety than those with low amyloid beta. However, this association was primarily in participants who were E4 carriers. So now I'm going to shift and uh, talk a bit about our work um, examining non-traditional uh, neurobehavioral symptoms. Um, a number of years ago, I became interested in uh, looking at loneliness as a possible psychiatric endophenotype. I thought it might be a uh, useful measure and sensitive measure to use in cognitively normal older adults. It's a non, it's technically not pathological. It is more normally distribu distributed within a, um, within a sample of normal older adults um, compared to depression and anxiety. And uh, given the complexity of social interactions, I considered that um, loneliness could be uh, a, a canary in the coal mine or an early signal of neurobehavioral decline. So we hypothesized that uh, loneliness may be a symptom of early amyloid beta or tau accumulation in regions involved uh, in cognitive, perceptual, or emotional processes important for social interactions. Uh, well, what is loneliness? Loneliness is the perception of social isolation. It's distinct from objective social isolation, um, which is more typically measured uh, using structural measures of social connection, such as social network size or uh, frequency of social interactions, social activities. Um, so it's the feeling or the experience of being disconnected. Loneliness is um, a very well-studied construct in aging. Um, it's been measured in many large international cohorts. And across those cohorts, about 16 to 22 percent of adults, uh, older adults, report high levels of loneliness. And about an equal number report more moderate levels of loneliness. Uh, and the UCLA loneliness scale is, was developed, actually, for use in, in older adults, although it's used across age ranges now. Um, this three-item version is commonly used. Um, and it asks, how often do you feel you lack companionship? How often do you feel you le feel left out? And how often do you feel isolated? Loneliness is more common in older men, uh, older women than older men in unmarried versus married individuals. Um, it's uh, relatively weakly correlated with social network size, with education level, with poor physical function, and personality traits such as neuroticism. Um, it's moderately correlated with depression. Um, for instance, in work that we did in the health and retirement study, we found that for our individuals classified as lonely, about half of them had high depression based on the CESD, but half did not. And for those who had high depression, about 12% were lonely. So they're related, but they're not uh, synonymous. 
And I should mention that in our research, we're primarily interested in loneliness that's not related to depression. We control for depression, and we use samples that are not, not clinically depressed. But, but I, we've been mostly interested in loneliness because of its association with cognitive decline. Um, in multiple epidemiologic cohorts, uh, loneliness has been associated with a worsening memory performance, increased progression to AD dementia, um, adjusting for many factors, demographics, social network depression, many uh, potential confounders. So in our first study looking at biomarker associations of loneliness, um, we uh, examined the cross-sectional association of amyloid beta burden uh, using PIB-PET with loneliness, and also whether or not this association was influenced by ApoE4 carrier status. This sample was comprised of 79 older adults, 45% men. And in addition to studying loneliness, you can see we measured uh, other uh, constructs, uh, GDS, anxiety, social network. And we used a continuous measure of neocortical PIB in this study. We found that higher uh, neocortical amyloid beta was associated with greater loneliness in cognitively normal older adults. And this association was, in fact, stronger in E4 carriers. We also performed many secondary analyses and um, found that this association was not affected by factors such as coronary artery disease, history of depression, um, use of antidepressant medications, and many other, uh, actually, neuroimaging markers. To enhance the interpretation of these findings, we carried out uh, logistic regression. So we created binary c categories for both amyloid beta and loneliness. Um, using a standard uh, cutoff, we classified a third of the um, uh, sample as amyloid beta positive. And the top third of our uh, sample was classified as lonely. Um, I could talk more about how we did that, but it, it worked out uh, based on how they endorsed uh, these three questions. And then comparing the high versus low amyloid beta groups, participants in the high amyloid beta gro group had a 7.5-fold higher odds of being lonely versus non-lonely than the low amyloid beta group. So this was a strong effect. More recently, uh, we've studied the association of tau accumulation and loneliness uh, in cognitively normal older adults. And we've looked at um, tau accumulation in the entorhinal cortex and the inferior temporal cortex using FTP, or float tau superior PET. And I should mention that this was introduced later into the Harvard Aging Brain Study in about the fourth year of the cohort. So again, this was a smaller sample. This was 100 and 17 or 18 uh, participants. We chose the entorhinal cortex um, because it's the site of initial tau accumulation in typical aging as well as in early Alzheimer's disease. Um, so this, is a fig this figure is showing neuropathological neurofibrillary tangle stages. So neurofibrillary tangles are tau-containing um, uh, deposits. and. Um, uh, so uh, in stages one through four, this is compatible with normal cognition, and you see uh, tau accumulation restricted to the entorhinal cortex for the most part. Um, and then in later stages, uh, tau it infiltrates the isocortex or the neocortex, and the representative region that we're looking at here is the in inferior temporal cortex. This is one of the first regions that starts to show tau as it propagates out of the entorhinal cortex. And this, these stages and beyond are, are much more associated with memory impairment. And 
I also just wanted to mention why we were thinking about why would the entorhinal cortex be related to loneliness or socio-emotional symptoms. Um, I think that the entorhinal cortex is not really understand, understood in terms of its role in emotional regulation, but it is a nexus between the hippocampus and the neocortex that's critical for episodic and semantic memory processes. And of course, this critical function includes information and memory processes related to social and emotional content. So we found that higher tau accumulation in the right entorhinal cortex was associated with greater loneliness, um, but there was no association with uh, left entorhinal cortex or the right or left inferior temporal uh, regions. And uh, here you can see we adjusted for age, sex, E4 status, and um, adjusted for multiple comparisons. And uh, we, this association survived uh, uh, a, a other outlier analyses. And then in, in other analyses, we, we added other uh, confounders, socioeconomic status, social network, depression, anxiety logical memory performance, and we put them all in together, and it did not affect this, uh, this, this association. This is a, a whole brain vertex-wise map uh, correlating UCLA loneliness scores with uh, FTP signal, um, and then you can see uh, correlations in the right uh, entorhinal cortex. And we were surprised, actually, to see clusters of association. This was not our predefined region of interest, but we found clusters of associations in the right fusiform gyrus as well, which is a region known to be involved in phase processing. We, we speculate that age-related or Alzheimer's disease pathological changes in the entorhinal cortex and in functionally connected regions could contribute to uh, deficient uh, social interactions um, or deficiencies in social interactions. Prior MRI, uh, MRI studies, functional MRI studies, uh, have shown that when you compare younger and older adults, older adults fail to activate the right temporal and limbic regions, including the fusiform gyrus, and specifically the fusiform gyrus, during emotional phase processing and phase recognition tasks. Instead, it's been noted that they recruit other regions interpreted to suggest compensatory network reorganization. So we think it's possible that pathology in the right EC and the right fusiform may be associated with deficiencies in the retrieval of semantic information from faces and altered face processing. And of course, this is a major complaint for people who are starting to decline um, uh, due to age-related or uh, Alzheimer's disease-related uh, 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 reasons. To summarize then um, more broadly across these studies, um, we found that in cognitively normal, non-depressed older adults, uh, we found associations of anxiety with subcortical amyloid beta deposition, as you recall, particularly in the thalamus and the uh, amygdala and a loneliness with neocortical amyloid beta deposition and tau pathology in the right entorhinal cortex. So we believe that these studies do support the hypothesis that certain neuropsychiatric symptoms are linked to AD-specific pathologies at the preclinical stage. But it remains unclear if these associations are clinically meaningful and clinically relevant. Um, I'd be happy to discuss that more. So this has been a snapshot of our work so far and just some of our work because we're also doing other work looking at social engagement um, as a, another um, potential neurobehavioral change. And we're also looking at the opposite direction, how psychosocial stress and loneliness, um, uh, states of disconnection may impact uh, cognitive outcomes. But taking the literature as a whole so far, it appears that um, uh, 
that transitional symptoms, um, such as loneliness and anxiety, may be less useful for determining risk in the population at large. There are many reasons for people to be anxious and lonely. But they may be clinically meaningful or useful prognostic markers in subgroups, such as people who are E4 carriers, something that we don't measure in psychiatry, um, or individuals with other biomarker evidence, such as high amyloid beta, which we don't measure, but I think we will be measuring in the future, um, or other uh, clinical features of early decline, um, such as subjective memory changes or um, changes in um, olfactory identification, other things that are being uh, researched. And of course, this work is ongoing. So I'm going to finish up now, but uh, need to acknowledge all the investigators and staff um, at the Harvard Aging Brain Study, including um, Emily Kilpatrick here, who is an important coordinator in the study and is now here at McLean. And, <laughs> and um, especially all of our participants and their families uh, who make this work possible. And uh, some of the research assistants and uh, interns at and residents who work with me uh, across the Brigham and MGH. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so the work you've done in preclin, I mean, it really is groundbreaking trying to look at the neuropathology of some of these more subtle symptoms. But we see a lot of patients with Alzheimer's disease who develop depression, with or without a prior history of depression, and they tend to be difficult to treat. And as you know, most of the studies of SSRIs, for the most part, and even SNRIs, have generally failed. Um, so although we have vigorously treat depression in people with Alzheimer's disease, we don't have great therapeutic options, and I'm just wondering if you have any insights into why that may be the case based on some of the work you've done with the neuropathological features of these preclinical psychiatric symptoms. Yeah, well, and also working other work that we do in more impaired stages as well. I didn't present that. But I, I so I, I don't like the word depression, and, I, and, and in the context of Alzheimer's disease, I really do prefer to think in terms of domains. And I, so apathy and anhedonia, I think, are very linked to neurodegeneration. So I think it's very hard to treat apathy and anhedonia, although there's some evidence that, say, methylphenidate may help. But, um, but it's due to, you know, tissue loss and synaptic loss. So. Um, I think that those particular aspects of depression may be particularly dif difficult to treat. Um, I think, though, um, and then what's depression, too? So I, I'd be interested in how you define depression in Alzheimer's disease. But then there's agitation. And um, is agitation on a continuum, say, with anxiety? And um, I mean, there's at the stage of Alzheimer's dementia, there's neurodegeneration. The neurodegeneration is so widespread that when you like review the literature and, and uh, try and understand what are the brain uh, associations with these symptoms, you find the same brain regions popping up, the anterior cingulate, um, uh, you know, the orbitofrontal cortices, and uh, you know, the really important regions in, in psychiatry. So um, I think it, it's going to be a big challenge. Um, I think we might be more successful in treating the distress-oriented symptoms in, uh, uh, in Alzheimer's disease uh, neuropsychiatry as opposed to the deficit symptoms. But that remains to be seen. Um, clinically, are you asking? I mean, uh, I think that uh, you, you're all experts here in uh, what to do. Um, and I, you know, I'd be interested also to how ECT fits into this as well, right? Um, I will mention also that there's emerging evidence that treatment of neuropsychiatric symptoms does, is associated with more favorable outcomes. So um, that's true at the preclinical stage and also in the symptomatic stages. So I think we really do need to treat these symptoms. Unfortunately, SSRIs, or citalopram in particular, is very helpful. Did I answer that question? <laughs> yeah. 
comparing um, um, families where there's a genetic basis of, uh, for dementia versus those that don't have the genetic basis? Oh. Oh. My question really is, is there, is there anything known about the difference between the group that has a genetic factor for dementia versus those that do not have the genetic factor? Um, so there's different, um, so there's familial forms of Alzheimer's disease um, which are uh, being actively studied less so in the neuropsychiatry, to be honest with you, and more in terms of the cognitive features and the, um, the natural history uh, and the biomarker associations with respect to cognition. Um, so that work is being done, and I can't really say much about the neuropsychiatry in that context. I think it is going to be really important, though, to look at neuropsychiatry in the context of APOE4, um, and uh, because it does seem that uh, this, this is uh, a disease potentiating factor um, that has uh, synergistic effects, if, if you will, with, uh, or let me put it another way, that um, I, I think in the population at large, in people who are amyloid negative, APOE4, it doesn't look like that has effects on psychiatric symptoms, but on people who have amyloid beta, it does seem like E4 is really important and potentiates both neuropsychiatric symptomatology and also disease progression. So I think we, under, we really need to understand that better. And I think that um, this is something that we're going to want to measure in psychiatry, uh, in geriatric psychiatry in the future. Yes? Follow, I want to follow up on that a little bit, um, the APOE4. Um, so maybe correct me if I'm wrong on this, but my understanding is that the more episodes of depression that somebody has in life, the higher they are, uh, the higher the risk they are for developing Alzheimer's disease. We know that people who have multiple episodes of depression are at much higher risk of developing diabetes. We know that people who have multiple episodes of depression are at much higher risk of developing cardiovascular disease. We know that people who have multiple episodes of depression have trouble sleeping. And all three of those factors are clear, supposedly independent risk factors for the development of Alzheimer's disease. So I'm curious, because if APOE4 later in life is predisposing people to developing Alzheimer's disease, do we really know, like, do we really have good data that it doesn't increase people's risk for developing depression earlier in life, cardiovascular disease earlier in life, diabetes earlier in life? Do we really have that data? It's associated with higher rates of cardiovascular disease, APOE4, for sure. Um, there, there ha so I've looked at this a bit, and what I can say is that there was a very large study. It was about 800 people, and it was a um, longitudinal study. It was quite eight, ten years, and uh, and it, it was looking across age groups, so it wasn't specific to older people. But it did not look like APOE4 was an independent risk factor for depression. But um, but there's no doubt that depression is a risk factor for um, Alzheimer's disease. And um, people are, really want to understand that. And, um, it, it, and I, I think that disease mechanisms may overlap that of loneliness and other forms of psychosocial stress. So there's different ways of, that people hypothesize that those things are connected. Either it's the pathophysiology of depression, you have hyper excitability in certain brain regions or hyperactivity of certain brain hubs. Um, or it could be associated with more neuroinflammation. There's a lot of evidence to suggest that. So um, they are all kind of interrelated. Um, but um, I, I was unaware of the fact that multiple episodes of depression uh, is, increases risk of Alzheimer's disease as opposed to a single episode, but yeah, it's possible. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I have a question uh, more about the 
amyloid uh, studies because obviously there is a big failure of antibodies against the amyloid yeah. for treatment of Alzheimer. But now also there are some studies that show, including the base inhibitor studies, show that there is an increase in psychiatric symptoms and anxiety specifically in patients who were treated with these medications. So you would expect based on your studies that by decreasing the amyloid burden, you would find that uh, the uh, neuropsychiatric symptoms are improving. But um, can you tell me more about uh, the, because I don't know if you, you try any of the treatments, to, I mean to do treatments in these patients that you were do, seeing, but uh, uh, what is the uh, literature is saying in terms of really uh, the neuropsychiatric symptoms in uh, decreasing the amyloid uh, burden. So, gosh, that's a great question. And, uh, you know, I don't know if Brent remembers this, but we, we've talked about that before. Um, I, I don't know those data. I, I, maybe you do, but it, it, they, they aren't collecting those data, and I don't know that they've been analyzed or published. Um, it sounds like you have some information on that. Um, Yeah. Right. Yeah. I'll, I'll just say that I, I don't think we know the answer to your question. These are really good questions. I think neuropsychiatric symptoms and dementia largely get ignored in the clinical trials that we're doing um, for reasons that probably are impacting some of these outcomes. I wouldn't be surprised. Um, it's whether some of these agents, like you mentioned, the base inhibitors are exacerbating anxiety symptoms related to their effect on whether it's inflammation or actually attacking amyloid. I mean, we, we have no idea. Uh, but in those base trials, from what I understand, is that their cognitive profiles actually got worse, not better. And was that mediated by an escalation in anxiety? It's certainly possible, but we don't, we don't know. I just think that there needs to be a lot more attention to the kind of work Nancy's doing, especially in the early stages of both preclinical MCI and early AD, in terms of the impact of these symptoms on clinical course, but also response to these trials. And um, those are probably tertiary or, or beyond outcomes that the companies are really interested in, but that data is there. Uh, it would be really interesting to look at that. But we've really gotten the attention of people in the preclinical and uh, uh, secondary prevention trial world. So I work with Risa Sperling, and you know we're conducting, we're part of the A4 study, which is administering anti-amyloid uh, therapy to uh, cognitively normal people who have high amyloid beta. And um, so there is an interest. We are measuring anxiety specifically in that trial. Actually, at baseline, people who had higher amyloid beta had higher anxiety. And, um, uh, and that'll be an outcome that we're going to be looking at, um, as well as depression. And uh, yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Nancy, so much for coming. That was wonderful. <laughs>